Over the course of its history, the Haut-Richelieu region has forged a rich and complex relationship with its American neighbor. Geography connects them and blood unites them. The different wars forced the conquered and the deported to find refuge along the Richelieu River. The Acadians were the first to be displaced, leaving their French Acadia behind, heading for New England. They would eventually come back north to settle in our region, building some of its oldest monuments, in addition to bringing certain traditions still very much alive today. Following the birth of the Republic of the United States, the arrival of the Loyalists, who remained devoted to the British crown, shaped our territory in a lasting way. Some individuals, namely Sir John Johnson, invested themselves personally, shaping their new land's culture and economy. La Petite Cadie. The expulsion of the Acadians, now that is a dark moment in our Canadian history. The massive expropriation of those North American Francophone people will last from 1755 to 1763. During this period, around 10,000 Acadians will be deported. For these people, it's the start of a long wandering, searching for a new place to redo their life. As of 1767, after years of exile, numerous Acadians arrive in the Haut Richelieu. Having left New England, they mostly traveled on foot, using a road well known to the runners of the woods, the Mohawk Trail. They founded a parish, the Haut Richelieu's oldest, and this parish will be named St. Margaret of Blair Findy. Then, La Petite Cadie, and finally, as we know it today, La Cadie. In 1800 and 1801, they built the St. Margaret of Blair Findy Church and its presbytery. The lot is, nowadays, registered as patrimonial. We say that the entrepreneur working on the presbytery's construction, a man named Basil Prou from Montreal, had, and I quote, the liberty of taking on the lands of the inhabitants all the wood necessary, the stones and the sand, without any compensations. Oh, the agony. We know that building a church with the means of that time was not an easy thing, but imagine having to transport from Montreal to Lecadie a bell weighing 600 pounds. That's over 270 kilograms. Now, some will say that Louis Cyr, an Acadian strongman, born very close in Saint-Cyprien de Naperville, once supported 559 pounds on one finger. But... He was not born yet. The bell will have a godfather, a godmother, and will be baptized. Quiz! According to you, under what name was the bell baptized? A. Evangeline, Evangeline. B. Mary Marguerite. C. Sagwins and roses, sassing the Moses. Or D. It was named Jean, Jean Bataille. That's it. B. Mary Margaret, head of the parish. By the way, the bell is still very reliable and still delights us with its high, soft sound. Mwah. Today, we find in the area of Lacadie a fascinating historical and patrimonial circuit. Indeed, the Acadians left us a rich heritage right down to the family names. Yes, nowadays, if you come across a Chiasson, a Prince, a Beliveau, a Granger, a Robichaud, or a Lanou, you are most certainly in the presence of an Acadian heir, those people of courage and hope. To soap yourself in the Acadian culture, the historic sector of Lacadie and Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu has more than one treasure to offer to the fans of patrimony. There are multiple activities, historical visits, concerts, and big events organized that allow us to discover the history of those people, the area, and the important figures that left their mark there. Every year, there's an ancient tradition perpetuated. 
the Maypole Plantation. Indeed, this tradition, brought by the French settlers, consists of planting a maypole during the month of May. A maypole is a big spruce of which we kept the leafy head. We then have to plant it in front of the house of someone we wish to honor, or in front of certain places of predilection, like a church or a chapel, and then follow a very particular ceremony. Quiz! What do we have to do when organizing a maypole plantation? A. Invite every citizen to decorate the spruce with little ribbons. B. Fire at the spruce with numerous gunshots to blacken it with soot, or C, organize a banquet and celebrate the return of spring. The answer is A, B, C, all of the above. In fact, the more the maypole will be blackened, the bigger the tribute will be. It is possible to attend a reconstitution of this tradition during the first weekend of May in front of the St. Margaret of Blair Findy Church. You can also discover l'Acadie by its art and its literature. Do you know Napoléon Bourassa? He married the daughter of the illustrious Louis-Joseph Papineau, Azélie Papineau, with whom he had five children. Napoléon Bourassa is an architect, a painter, a sculptor, and a writer born on October 21, 1827, in l'Acadie. His famous novel, Jacques and Marie, Souvenir d'un peuple dispersé, tells the story of the separation of two lovers during the tragic expulsion of the Acadians in 1755. A park in the Lacadie area was named after Jacques and Marie in memory of this great book. Napoleon Bourassa also deeply involved himself in favoring the development of visual arts in Quebec from the middle of the 19th century. To valorize this great man, we encourage you to visit the Parc des Ancêtres to see the monument built in his honor. This monument is situated near the primary school that is named after him and that is embellished by a beautiful historic mural, Lacadie, from past to present, the builders. Napoleon Bourassa's busy life is extremely interesting to discover, which you can do by participating in a family scavenger hunt in Lacadie. This touristic circuit is a game of observation called On the Hunt for Napoleon's Lost Treasure, created by the city of Saint-Jean-sur-Richelieu in collaboration with the author Marie-Lou Desnoyers, the illustrator Noémie Demers, and the photographer Émilie Gaudreau. You can get a hold of the participation book for free at the Tourist Information Office, the Presbytery, or even at the Church of Lacadie. The Great Story of the O'Richelieu Loyalists When the United States won the American Revolutionary War against England, which took place from 1775 to 1783, around 100,000 American colonists fled their country. Indeed, during this conflict, all 13 colonies' residents were not on the same page. The third of them were opposed to this desire of independence and would rather stay faithful and loyal to the King of England. That is why we called them the Loyalists. They will not only lose the fight, but they will also lose their American citizenship, be threatened, and some will even go to prison. To encourage the establishment of Loyalists in Canada, our government will pass an imperial law which allows Loyalists to import, without taxes, their furniture, their farming tools, their clothes, and even, yes, their slaves. Upon their arrival in Canadian territory, notably in the Haut Richelieu, the Loyalists will find out that they represent a minority in a population mainly Francophone and Catholic. They are shocked to have to respect laws and institutions that are not the ones we should find under a British regime. Consequently, they have three demands. The first one is that we divide the land in townships instead of the seigneurial system. The second one is that we establish a house of assembly and that we hold elections. The last one, and not the least, is that we apply the habeas corpus. Quiz! But what is the habeas corpus? A. 
An extremely hydrating moisturizer made in England. B. Medicine against scorpions and fleas. C. A legal notion stating we cannot be imprisoned without a judgment. The answer is C. More precisely, the habeas corpus ad subjiciendum et recipiendum, which actually means that even if a person is arrested, they still have the right to know why and of what they are accused, and also they conserve their rights. London will answer in favor of the loyalists' demands. And in 1791, with the adoption of the Constitutional Act, which will replace the Quebec Act of 1774, we will see a House of Assembly appear. With this new Constitutional Act, the Loyalists obtain the creation of the Upper Canada, which allows them to establish their own community to the west of the Catholic Francophone population in the St. Lawrence Valley. From now on, Canada is divided into politically, physically, and culturally speaking. Nevertheless, some Loyalists will choose to establish themselves in Lower Canada, notably here in the Haut-Richelieu, and will leave a mark on our local history. take interest today in a loyalist from the area that definitely left his mark, Sir John Johnson. He was an officer, an official, a politician, a property owner, and a seigneur. John Johnson was born in the United States on November 5, 1741, in Fort Johnson, in the state of New York. He was the only child of a very rich land owner. John Johnson was always a fervent advocate of the British crown, and it is in 1765 that he obtains the title of Sir by King George III, who will name him Knight due to his services in regard to the homeland. Since the first years of the American Revolution, Johnson supports the crown with passion against the American colony's desire of independence. But he will be forced to flee up north, to our territory, to find refuge during the spring of 1776. As of his arrival in Canada, he creates the King's Royal Regiment of New York in order to fight the Americans, and he is then put in charge of the establishment of thousands of exiled loyalists. In 1795, Sir Johnson acquires the Monoir Seigneury, which is spread out over 84,000 acres. It is on this territory that the municipalities of Maryville, St. Bridget d'Iberville and a part of St. Alexandre and the Mont Saint Grégoire will be established. Between 1798 and 1826, Sir Johnson concedes more than 500 lands to censitaires on his seigneury. Quiz! What do censitaires have to do to obtain land? A. They have to populate the land as fast as possible. B. They have to build a house, clear the land, and constantly exploit it. Whew. Or C. They have to plant cabbage in the fashion, in the fashion. They have to plant cabbage in the fashion that we do. The answer is B. In addition to exploiting the land, they have to pay once a year royalties and allowances in the form of money or wheat. Notable fact, Sir Johnson is one of the rare seigneurs that did his contracts in French and in English and even sometimes in specific native languages. You must know that Sir Johnson was very close to the Iroquois and will be designated as General Superintendent of the Indigenous and Northern Affairs of Canada in 1782. In time, he will possess multiple residences, notably in Montreal, Lachine, and Kingston in Upper Canada. But Sir John Johnson particularly prefers the territory dominated by the Mont Saint-Grégoire. Besides, he will give the mountain the name Mount Johnson, a name that will remain until 1930 when it will be changed to Mont Saint-Grégoire. Sir Johnson likes the area so much 
that he decides after the death of his oldest son in 1812 to build at the foot of the mount a family funeral vault that you can visit on the site of Sim O. Richelieu. And it is to this vault that the remains of Sir John Johnson will be transported from Montreal in January 1830. During his funeral, there is an impressive cortege of friends, family, officers, Freemasons, and even 300 Iroquois that came to honor him one last time. It is an unprecedented event. There even is the leader, La Zake Tekon Wamisan, who recites a eulogy in Mohawk in his honor. We say that Sir John Johnson was a man who chose to unite nations instead of dividing them. Go visit the amazing fallow of Sim O. Richelieu to see his funeral vault. Coming from New England or the Atlantic coast, the populations who found shelter in the O. Richelieu shaped the history of the region forever. The traditions and the monuments they gave us are enduring proof of their passage. The O. Richelieu region was part of the wars which led to the creation of Canada and the United States. Despite the misfortunes of defeat, men and women found a new beginning in this generous land.